Good morning, everyone. This is Krista King-Oaks, Youth Services Consultant with the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. Thank you for joining us for our Fall 2018 Teen Read Week webinar. Today's hosts are Laura Beth fox Izell, Youth uh, Services Education Outreach Specialist with the Warren County Public Library, and Veronica Rainwater, Youth Services Coordinator for the Warren County Public Library. The title of their show is Started from the Bottom, Now We're Here, Implementing New Teen Programming into the Public Library, and we are very excited to hear about all the innovative and great programming they have going on down there. Just remember, if you have any issues with the audio in today's webinar, to try the audio wizard setup in the top menu bar of your screen. Otherwise, as we are going along, I will monitor uh, the chat for questions, um, links, and the like. Do please hold off on your questions until the end of the show, and we will get to them at that time. We want to thank the Institute for Museum of Library Services for uh, providing the funding for today's webinar. And at this time, I will turn it over to our host with the Warren County Public Library. Take it away. Thank you, Krista. Yes, thanks, Krista. <laughs> and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for waking up early with us and being here to talk about teen programming. We are excited. Yeah, and before we start, we do want to say we are using a landline um, at our library. And if someone rings through to this line, just ignore it. We apologize. <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> yeah, and if, if it interrupts anything we say, just let us know and we'll repeat it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're going to go on and get started. Um, we did do a poll at the beginning. If you have not answered that, feel free to. We are just trying to see how many of you all have experience with teens already, how many of you have tried teen programming, but it didn't work out for you. Just so that we know where we stand, we can kind of anticipate some of your questions. And we're going to break this presentation up about 50-50, so I'm going to be with you here at the first half of the presentation. I'm Laura Best, and then you'll hear Veronica chime in throughout, and then I'll hand it over to her for the second half of the presentation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Started from the bottom, now we're here. So the first thing um, <laughs> we want to assure you all is that teens are out there. Uh, we promise. Sometimes it feels, I think, that teens are one of the hardest groups to serve through public libraries. Um, they seem aloof, and sometimes when you plan a program with them in mind, um, they don't show up. And so we just wanted to encourage and reiterate that teens are out there. And we, one of our biggest issues um, with teen programming at our library was we really didn't have like steady carved out programming for teens. Um, and we realized that after we attended the YALSA Symposium in Louisville, Kentucky, where we were really inspired by the regular programming they had available um, there, they were discussing there, and so we were inspired to change that at our specific location. We received the YALSA Programming Prize um, after we left the symposium, and we used some of the ideas that we heard there to develop plans uh, for programming at our location um, over this past summer and continuing on. So the first thing that we did that was the biggest kind of launch into this new phase of teen programming for this year um, was theater camp. And that was an idea that we uh, we heard about at the YALSA Symposium, and we didn't really know that it was so popular among teens until we heard all of these positive reports from other libraries who had implemented the same thing. Um, we were lucky to be able to partner with a local theater company here in Bowling Green called BG On Stage, and they're a local nonprofit, and they were able to work alongside us to really provide an authentic theater experience for these kids. Um, it was a really um, immersive camp for them. It was a five-day, all-day camp. They all worked on a production together. They learned all about how to memorize their lines, how to um, block a play, how to work with each other in theater etiquette. And then at the end of the week, they performed a theater on the stage of BG on stage. 
um, for their friends and family. It was a really wonderful experience for them and for the families and for us too because we were able to really connect to teens at this time. And it was a great way for us to really establish relationships with teens in our area, teens who uh, were interested in being involved with the library and um, let them know that we're here for them and we care about them and we want to do things that they're interested in. And it was really relatively low cost. We, with a partnership with BG on stage and um, with handmade props that the teens could make themselves with supplies, most of which we already had at the library, super simple costumes that they made themselves. It was, um, it was really feasible. We're excited to do, to, to do it again in the future. So after the theater camp, we decided to launch our teen advisory board um, with the goal of taking it sort of to the next level, to involve teens who really wanted to have a voice in what their public library plans and does for them. And we did this because we wanted our teens to have a direct um, role in the decision making for programs for them because we don't want to speak for them. We know that they know their group and their age group and their interests better than we can even pretend to. Um, we, all, we like to think that we're young <laughs> at heart, but we know that we are, you know, we don't know the, the trends, we don't know what they're interested in right now, so we want to make sure we're giving them a direct voice. And so the Teen Advisory Board is meant to do that. It's also meant to increase our connections and our relationships with the teens and give them an opportunity to put something awesome on their resume. Professional involvement in a community organization always looks great, and their parents are excited that they are uh, participating in something like this as well, so everyone can kind of get on board with it. So sorry about that pun. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in our developing process for the Teen Advisory Board, we just knew that we wanted to be very clear about our expectations both from us as we plan it and facilitate it, and both for the teens, what we expect from them. So as we began to get our advertising together, we wanted to be clear and direct about what the Teen Advisory Board is and what becoming a Teen Advisory Board member will mean. Um, the application and interview process is essential to this because it requires the applicant to um, work to be a part of it. It means that they actually want to be a part of it when you get an application. Um, they have to answer questions about their interests, um, their involvement in other organizations, uh, their age and what school they go to, so we're aware of where they are in the community, and also um, their ideas. And so we kind of get a head start of what they're thinking that we should do in the future for their age group. Um, and then we ask them, once we receive an application, we ask them to come in and sit down for an interview that really doesn't take very long at all, like 15 minutes. And Veronica and I sit down with them and we ask them questions just about, you know, what book they're reading and their ideas for what libraries can do um, for them, how they found out about the Teen Advisory Board. And we use that time to get to know them and also convey library policies, just like safety procedures and dress code. And just it's a moment for us to set the ground rules for communication, letting them know email is important. If they don't have an email account, talk to their parents or guardians about setting one up so that we can establish a professional line of communication with them. Um, overall, it's a great learning experience for them to understand what an interview process is. And um, it just enables us to all be on the same page. And then once the interview process is over, basically we haven't turned anyone away <laughs> yet. If they apply and they show up to an interview, essentially they're in. They got it. <laughs> they got the job. So um, after that, we meet regularly. We meet once a month, um, sometimes more often if we're working on something big together. Um, we sit down and figure out the best time to meet when we're at the meeting, but it's always on a Monday. So they can expect it will always be on a Monday at this time. Um, but we sit down and we figure out what Monday will work the best for everybody. And at our meetings, we share ideas and we work on planning programs. And most of what I do is I just listen to them. I listen to what they have to say and I take lots of notes 
and I report that to our management team so that they are aware of what the teams in our area are asking for. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to show uh, sort of what we did to advertise the Teen Advisory Board. We made a flyer um, that just lists everything, what it is, what are the requirements, how do you apply, just direct. And we posted them around town and in our library. And I will say that our teens told us when we asked them in the interview how they heard about the Teen Advisory Board, they, um, they said the flyers in the library. And so we <laughs> realized, oh, you are all here. We just haven't seen you or maybe you've been looking for us and you haven't found something for you yet. So that was really encouraging for us to hear that they were already inside our library. We were just we were just missing them. We weren't serving them. We weren't giving them an opportunity to get involved. And so now we were, and we were hearing them. And so that was uplifting. We also um, communicated the opportunity to our middle and high school librarians. They are going to be um, your biggest allies. So if you don't already have connections with your middle and high school librarians, and you're trying to get teens in your libraries, um, definitely reach out to them. They are wonderful. Okay, next slide, challenges. So with that, all of that being said, we have definitely had our setbacks and challenges since the um, implementation of the Teen Advisory Board. Really just the biggest thing is um, access and transportation. They're not all going to have the same level of transportation. They're not going to have the same support groups at home to get them to the meetings, and they're not all going to have internet access at home to communicate with email. We've since implemented a, a group text that has actually worked really well um, with staying a little bit more in contact on their level, um, but with even that in being in mind, there are going to be some challenges, and sometimes, um, you know, there's going to be restrictions to getting them in the building. Um, really, a lot of it just has to do with the fact that teens are just, they are so busy. Talking to them and hearing about their week makes me tired. <laughs> <laughs> they are so involved in so many things. And so the biggest thing from a facilitator's perspective, what I have learned is to just stay very patient and realistic about what they can do, um, understand when they can't be at a meeting, and keep them in the loop. If you haven't seen them for a month, it's okay. They still want to be involved. They still want to stay in the loop. They're just waiting for an opportunity to get to um, a program or a volunteer opportunity or a meeting that works best with their schedule. So just stay flexible. And with challenges, also our victories. Um, since uh, its establishment early this year, we've grown to 11 members, which has been fantastic to see. Uh, the first meeting we had, everyone was so shy and scared, and they barely talked at all, <laughs> and now um, they're great friends, and they work great together. They've planned a program called Criminal Activity all by themselves. They planned this program, and they facilitated the program. So they planned it, and then they showed up, and they hosted it for their own peers. It was, it was so awesome to witness. So it's hard work, but it's so rewarding when you see what they can do. Looking toward the future, uh, they've told us they want a book club. Obviously, it seems so obvious that we should have a book club. <laughs> We're a library. Um, but we didn't have a teen book club, so we are starting one. Um, it's called Readers Anonymous. One of the things that they uh, let us know is that they are constantly reading things other people are telling them to read. So we're letting them read whatever they want to read and just come over to the library and talk about a book that they are reading right now and share it with their peers. Um, we also have recently implemented an idea lab um, in our one of our library branches, and so we're trying to get teens um, in there. We're seeing mostly adult users in the idea lab, and we would love to see teens uh, use that as well. So we're doing DIY Teen Tuesdays, um, which will just take them through different things that they can create and take with them after school. We're doing this in our idea lab, which is a maker space, but this is super accessible to anyone. If you don't have a maker space, you can still make buttons or friendship bracelets or tie-dye. They just 
teams are really into creating with their hands, and they're super excited about this one. Um, yeah, and to feed off of that, um, just, I guess, it's proof if you don't believe us. <laughs> uh, we do have a big maker space. It's really cool. It's got a lot of machines in it. But what Laura Beth was saying about you can do this anywhere, we're actually implementing a very similar program with tweens. So that 10, 11, 12-year-old range, um, maybe even 8 and 9-year-old, mm -hmm. at one of our other library locations that is located in the Housing Authority. It's very, very small, but very, very mighty. Um, and we have another youth services member who is going to be doing some DIY things with them. So the program is going to be called Try It Tweens, which is super cute. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can definitely do this anywhere um, and at any time with anyone. And really, with stuff that a lot of y'all already have in your branches, we can just create, honestly, with any supplies you have lying around, I think that teens have... Um, a real creative knack and are just trying to, I think they are um, craving that um, just interaction with each other and also with um, older older people in their um, in their communities that they can look up to as leaders. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to hand it over to Veronica for Yas Bukan. So I'm going to be talking about some of our uh, community-wide programs that involve teens or based directly around teens. Um, and none of these existed prior to uh, 2017, so they are all relatively new. Um, the very first community-wide event that we implemented was, is, well, is called Yaz BookCon. Um, and our first time doing Yaz BookCon was in 2017, so last year. Now, Yaz is it stands for Young Adult Southern Book Convention, but we did model it after, you know, the slang, yes, mm. um, just to kind of grab teens' attention. And it was a response to our growing teen audience at our Southern Kentucky Book Fest. Um, it has grown and grown and grown, and that was in large part to the teens that were coming there with their schools and groups, or even just individually on, the Satur on Saturday. Um, and so we were like, huh, you know, teen, honestly, teen book fests are very, very trendy right now. Um, there is one in Charleston called Y'all Fest, and um, myself, our director, and another manager actually took a trip up there, um, and we called it work, <laughs> and we kind of looked and participated in Y'all Fest in Charleston to see how it ran, because it is one of the best teen book festivals in our nation, I believe, um, that I've gone to. It, it's a lot of fun. It's all outdoors. It's very fast-paced. It's just kind of like nothing I've ever been to before. And so we decided that we wanted to model something after this, but of course on a much smaller scale for Bowling Green. Um, and so we came up with Yes, and it takes place about mid-October. It's going to be October 19th this year. Um, we also have about 50 authors. Uh, it's going to be taking place over one day this year, and we do include panels and workshops. So writing workshops, um, we do yoga. Laura Beth is a yoga instructor. She's going to be doing yoga with our teens Yay. and any adults that attend. Um, we're going to actually, well, I'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> but we are anticipating about 700-plus attendees this year um, between teens and adults, and this is just because we do some group registration, so we can anticipate our numbers a little bit. Um, this year, our headliner is going to be Nick Stone, the author of Dear Martin. I'm sure you all have heard of her. She is fantastic and wonderful in every way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very, very excited to have her. Um, I do want to touch on some things that we learned from last year, because I always like to talk about our mistakes, because... I mean, we know that that's how we grow, and that's how we help you not make the same mistakes that we made. Um, so we have decided to have Yas Book Con on campus at Western Kentucky University this year. And the whole purpose of this is to make it more accessible. We're a library. We're all about making things, you know, very, very easy for our patrons to attend. 
and less cost prohibitive, um, travel prohibitive. And so this year is going to take place at their Downing Student Union, which is basically their little home base for students to come and study and hang out and eat and uh, really kind of the social hub of our campus. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. It's going to be facilitated by them. They're fantastic. We're going to have um, campus college tours, too. So we're going to make it kind of an immersive experience. We're going to have a lot of high schoolers there, a lot of middle schoolers there, and we want them to be able to see a college campus um, and kind of start putting that in their head that this is, some, this is a place that they can attend, and if not this place, then another place. Uh, also, we're going to be doing college essay writing workshops there, so really kind of bringing it full circle. Mm -hmm. We're also making it more manageable. <laughs> Last year, we had a book con that was over the course of two days. Now, that is reasonable if your book con warrants it. If you do not have the audience to support two full days worth of book conning, then don't do it. You're just going to wear yourself out. Um, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to set yourself up for failure. So we decided this year, as I said before, to make it over the course of one day. And it's going to be a very full day. So from 9 until about 2, we're going to be on campus doing our main um, writing workshops. We're going to be doing our main panels. We're going to have our keynote by Nick Stone. We're going to do author signings. But then later in the evening, about 4 to 8, we're going to be downtown Bowling Green. So we're going to be at all of our local shops. Um, and we're also going to have a pop-up store or a pop-up shop at Barnes & Noble where you can come attend a panel. Um, we're also, we are bent on making it representative. We are mm -hmm. always striving to make things more diverse. Uh, for our community. We're always striving to make things more representative of the people in our nation. Um, so we make sure this year that our, our author list is more well-rounded and diverse as well. Um, and speaking of diversity, this kind of leads right into um, my next topic. Uh, last year and prior years, we had an opportunity for our community called So He Reads. Um, and we do still have So He Reads. It's just not going to be taking place at the same time it was before. Um, it usually took place around September and October. And it's basically just our big community read. So we would choose a book. We would give that book out for free throughout our community. Everyone would read it. And then we would kind of reconvene at an event and meet the author and talk about the book. And it was a really fun time. Um, when we started Yaz Book Con last year, we did do So He Reads in conjunction with it, and we used a young adult author. Prior to that year, we used a middle grade author. So we were starting to see that So He Reads was turning into more of a teen-driven thing. And so we, were, we kind of had it in the back of our minds that we needed to address that. Do we want this to keep being a teen-driven thing? Do we want to take it back to adult books, adult fiction, or not? And um, still addressing that issue of diversity, diverse books, um, not just ethnic groups, but different gender orientations as well. Um, because we do have a big problem, especially in the publishing industry, about showcasing uh, minority groups of all kinds. So uh, this brings me to Project Lit. And I'll start with the issue that we have that I just stated. Um, and I have a quote up here from Education Dive, um, an online article that I found that was based all around Project Lit. So for many students, many teens, many people, really, mm -hmm. in impoverished areas nationwide, book deserts hinder their ability to build and practice those crucial literary literacy skills in a book desert, residents do not have print books immediately available via public libraries or bookstores for a couple of miles or much more. So essentially, book deserts mean that you do not have access to literature. Um, it may be because you can't afford to keep books in your home. It may be because you don't have a library within walking distance or within driving distance of you. It may be because you don't know the value of books. 
uh, we all know that there's a lot of contributing factors to why people don't engage in reading. Um, one of the biggest reasons for minority groups, I believe, is that we're not being properly represented in the literature that we're reading or being asked to read. Sometimes it can be really hard to connect to a character that you have nothing in common with. Sometimes we're just not interested in connecting to characters we have nothing in common with. Um, I do have some data here, and at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to see um, my sources for those as well, but I tried to put as much of it up here as possible. Uh, I just wanted to really show the discrepancy between the race makeup in our nation and how many people of color were accounted for in children's books in 2016. So about 39% of America is... A, minor, a minority group. Um, about 12% of books that are being published by big publishing houses represented just ethnic groups. We're not even getting into any kind of sexual orientation. Um, that would bring the percentage down a little bit lower. Um, and so when we see that really big gap, what we need to start doing is thinking about how we can make a difference on our level, at the library level. Um, and the answer to this, especially uh, for the person who started Project Lit, was to make a nationwide book club that was for teens, for middle grade readers as well, that kind of showcased all the books that are either being written by diverse authors or representing diverse characters. And Jared Amato, of Maplewood High School in Nashville, Tennessee, is actually the person who started Project Lit. Um, he started as an initiative to target and potentially eradicate book desert. Um, he does live in Nashville, Tennessee, and he saw in his own community that there were tons of children that did not have access regularly to books outside of the classroom. And if they did have access to books, they weren't books that showed characters that looked or sounded like them, or that were written by people like them. Um, so he thought of the name Project Lit. He thought that it would be kind of just a cool thing where he could kind of uh, do some fundraisers, where he could raise funds to buy books to just give children. Um, so he did that. He, he raised some funds. He bought books um, that showcased those groups. And then he put them directly into the hands of teens that needed them. So after that, uh, he thought that, you know, maybe those teens actually need a place to sit and talk about the topics that are being discussed. Uh, in young adult literature, there are a lot of hot topics that are kind of difficult to talk about in casual conversation. They might not even be something that you want to talk about with your family or with your friends at all. You might not feel entirely comfortable talking about them outside of a recognized safe space. Um, or you might just not know really how to talk about them. Mm -hmm. So he started designing book clubs that he would host, and all the readers that he gave the books to would come to this book club and they would talk more about the books that they were reading. Um, when he saw that this was really popular amongst his teens, he decided to take it nationwide. And the way that he did this, he um, made it possible for people to become chapters of Project Lit and to implement the same things in their communities, making it super accessible to libraries, to schools. Um, so I actually stumbled upon this on Twitter. They have a very, very large community. Um, they're very, very active in that community. I asked him if libraries could become a chapter because I was looking through some of the members. It looked like it was very, very largely school-based. Jarrett was very open to our library system becoming a part of Project Lit. In fact, he's been open to a lot of things. He hasn't told us no for anything once, and we started back in March, I believe, applying. So we applied to become a chapter, we were accepted, and then we started making a plan on how we wanted to implement it. At this point, we did not have our teen advisory board, so we were still kind of floating around wondering what teens would like, would respond to, and would not. We did not know a lot. So we wanted to basically mirror what Jared was doing in Nashville. So we wanted to 
get books, we wanted to give them to teens, we wanted to come back to the library, have book clubs, book talks, that kind of thing, and we wanted to do it about three to four times a year. So Project Lit always publishes a book list with minority authors or minority characters on it that you can pick from. You can always pick books off that list if you want to. It's just kind of a guiding post. Uh, Laura, Beth, and I took a look at the list, and we picked four different books off of it. And we sat down, and we were very excited. We began making our plans to have our book clubs in our housing authority at our main library, places where we knew teens could walk. And I think it was at that point that we really started getting some community investment, particularly with our Soki Book Fest partners, so our larger book festival. Soki Book Fest, um, really the coordinator, Sarah Volpe, she heard that we were doing Project Lit. Now, initially, we funded the purchase of 10 books per title, so a total of 40 books through the Y'all's a Stipend that Laura Beth mm -hmm. mentioned before. We were going to be able to give 10 books out to different children in our community and hopefully have them come back to our book discussions, and we were very happy with that. That is a very manageable thing for you to start as a chapter of Project Lit. But we received the opportunity to make it even bigger through Sarah Volpe and our partners through Soki Book Fest. They proposed that Soki Book Fest become a partner and that Project Lit turn into what Soki Reads used to be to an extent, but for teens. So instead of Soki Reads, we would have Project Lit and we would move Soki Reads to a different part of the year. So if I have not confused you. <laughs> Project Lit was going to now be what we did in October, coinciding with our Yaz Book Con. So our fall was turning into a fully immersive teen experience through literature. Our Soki Book Fest partners, which are up on the slide, they matched our second book purchase, and we were able to buy about 400 books total between the library and our Soki Book Fest partners. And they have also been responsible for coordinating community-wide events. So instead of just having book discussions at our library, we have planned them on WKU's campus. We've planned them at different community spots uh, that are very, very popular. And then we have had some at the library. So we're actually in the midst of our very first project lit right now, like right this very moment. Mm -hmm. We um, have two discussions scheduled next week. We had our first one at the end of September, and it was really, really successful. We actually had students come from campus that were coming not even for extra credit, just because they were interested. And we gave out some of our books during that session as well. We had tons of great questions. We had a really great panel that was organized by Sarah Volpe. It was, it was fantastic. And from that, we had some of the college students reach out to me directly to ask if they could volunteer for Yaz BookCon to help out in any way they could, and if they could volunteer to be a part of Project Lit going forward. So helping us coordinate things, helping us promote things, helping us run it, just being a part of it, reading the books that we're all reading together. So there was immediate community buy-in. And they were from diverse groups. It was crazy. <laughs> They've been there all along. So we started with doing some book giveaways. We hosted book giveaways at our main library and our Bob Kirby branch, our two biggest libraries in our system. We also had one at our community farmer's market. And we gave away about 25, 20 to 25 books at each location. We also reached out to middle and high schools, and we gave each one that responded back to us that was interested 20 to 25 books to give to their students or to incorporate in their collection, which they're very, they're very, very grateful for because school libraries do not have the same kind of budget that public libraries have, as we all know. So any kind of book donation is usually 
accept it with open arms and when we give them a full classroom set, they are super, super excited. And this also created buy-in for their students to come to Yaz Book Con that's going to take place on the 19th. So when they saw that, you know, we're giving away free copies of Dear Martin, which is the first book that we're reading together, they jumped on board because they knew their students would be able to meet Nick Stone at Yaz Book Con and kind of bring things full circle. After the book giveaways, we started in on our panel discussions. We're planning to host three. As I said before, we already have done one. Uh, our next one is going to be at the main library, and our last one is going to be at Spencer's Coffee House in Bowling Green, uh, the most popular coffee house here. And it's going to be led by one of the doctors on campus that leads tons and tons of different diverse talks. She has diversity grad students. She comes to our Get Lit Book Club. So we have people actually from the community buying in, and we're lifting their voices up, too, so that they can be heard. Um, at our very last, I, no, it might be the next one that we're doing, we're going to have teams on our panel. So teams from our teen advisory board are going to be there. We're going to have teams of parents that we know <laughs> that attend some of our library events as well. So we're also kind of showcasing our teen audience as well, which of course is what this is all about. It's all going to culminate in meeting Nick Stone on October 19th, and at the end of Yaz Book Con, we're going to a group movie viewing of The Hate You Give because that's going to come out on October 19th as well. Okay. Yeah, we're going to show up really early, right? <laughs> Get good seats. But we're all going to do that together because it's about building community, and we can make all the plans we want, but if we're not sitting down on these kids' level and enjoying things with them, then it's not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. So Project Lit sessions that are going to be coming up are going to feature Angie Thomas, Justina Ireland, and Elizabeth Acevedo. I truly apologize if I have butchered her last name. But they're going to be similar in nature. On the come up that's coming out, and with Angie Thomas, we're actually going to get a few copies for our teen advisory board, and then we're going to get paperbacks of the hate you give to uh, distribute to the community because it is more cost effective. And that project lit event is going to be taking place the winter spring of next year, so coming up soon. We're going to be doing Dread Nation by Justina Ireland spring summer, so prior to summer reading. We're really excited about that. Super good book. And then we're going to be featuring Poet X in the fall of 2019 to correspond with our 2019 Yaz Book Con. And we're hoping dearly that we can get Elizabeth to come and be a part of that so that we can kind of have a redo of what we've done this year where the kids get to read the book, talk about the book, meet the author, ask them questions, and get their free book signed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, meeting the author is such an awesome um, experience. It's so exciting and encouraging to see um, kids see authors that look like them and for them to get to, to interact with the author and realize they're just a normal, normal person, just this great human being that they're able to have a relationship with because they're real yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah. and they're willing to come to their town. It's wonderful. Yeah, authors are always like the celebrities that you actually want to meet. Because yeah, <laughs> most of the time they're very kind, down-to-earth people, and it's very uplifting to our teens to have idols, mm -hmm. I suppose, that they can look up to like that. Good role model. So, looking into the future, we're going to keep our momentum going. Uh, we are not turning back anytime soon. Have we had failures? Technically, yes. <laughs> we don't look at them so harshly. We look at them as moments of growth because that's exactly what they are. We don't give up, so it doesn't really count as a failure. We have had some teen programs that we have tried out where we haven't quite gotten our target audience, which I'm sure you have or will see a lot of. You'll get adults of all kinds of ages wanting to participate participate or you'll get really, really young kids or preschoolers wanting to participate, and that's fine. 
uh, we have looked at different things and we have talked to our teen advisory board and we've seen how we can tweak things so that we don't do that mistake again. Um, also, moving on with Laura Beth and the teen advisory board. Yes, well the teen advisory board, it's grown so much um, since its original implementation. We um, originally required everyone to be at least at 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 least one meeting a month and we had kind of like rigid expectations I think looking back like thinking that's not too much to ask but really it was. Um, so just being more lenient looking at the teen advisory board is something that um, we want them to be at and we don't want them to feel guilty um, if they can't come to a meeting. They can help us at a distance if they need to for um, you know, a couple of weeks if they need to be at band. Right now, one of them is at band, and she's texting, like, <laughs> good luck, everyone. Like, I'm at band, and I'll be here, you know, next time. And so, so just, like, the, the relationship and the connection is the most important thing, um, and just maintaining that. That's the most important thing. Um, whether they physically show up to be at a meeting isn't always the most important thing. And sometimes, you know, when you're writing down staff, that can feel a little bit um, uh, discouraging, but they're all still there, and we're all still working on programming for the future, and their voices are still being heard. So that's the most important thing. Um, theater camp round two, we're going to make it less long. <laughs> last, um, last summer it was a five-hour day. We were there from, oh my gosh, we were there from nine to three. Yeah. And um, it was just a long day for everybody. I mean, it was a great experience, and it was truly a theater camp. It really was. Um, but we're, it wasn't very um, conducive to uh, library staff members' schedules, and we're trying to be um, uh, keep that in mind and uh, just make it more feasible for us to do again and again and not wear us down. <laughs> Readers Anonymous, of course, is our book club that's coming up, and our first meeting is also this month, um, as well as the DIY uh, teen programming series that are going to be hosted at um, two of our branches, so we're very excited about those upcoming programs. And we are looking, as you all probably are as well, at summer reading already. We have booked an illustrator for an illustrator's workshop for teens. Last or This past summer reading, we did an illustrator's workshop, and we had it for ages like 7 to 16. Well, and that is a, an age range that we use frequently with programming, but we usually see somewhere in the middle we get our, you know, our actual audience. This time we actually got from 7 to 16 years old, and it wasn't great <laughs> because 7-year-olds and 16-year-olds are not interested in the same thing. No. And so we looked at the popularity of that, and we looked at, you know, how teens responded to that, and now we have broken it down into two segments. So we got an illustrator for the younger kids, and we have an illustrator specifically for the older kids, and he actually uh, specializes in anime and manga, too, so things that they're interested in, mm -hmm. and that's going to be taking place this coming summer 2019. We are going to continue Project Lit. We're going to be doing it three times a year. As I mentioned before, it's going to be a winter, spring, and then spring, summer, and then a fall. And we're going, we can't wait to see what the book list is going to be for the next go around so that we can see what we can pick from and if we want to pick anyone different, the authors that we can possibly get to come in. But something I want to reiterate is that if this had never happened, if we had never partnered with our Sokey Book Fest partners, it still would have been great. It still would have been wonderful. We still would have been giving books to teens and putting them in their hands. And even if it was 10 teens, it would have been 10 teens that might not have had that book before. Mm -hmm. Some of the responses that we've been given from the schools that have been passing out the books is that their teens would come to them and say that they, this is the first book that they have had for themselves in their home since elementary school or ever, mm -hmm. or ever. And that's really powerful. We were able to give them a book that they actually wanted to read and that they can keep. And they can do whatever they want with it forever. And it's something that, you know, we don't really think about on a daily basis. We can get consumed in the outcome mm -hmm. 
but there are still kids out there that do not have books of their own to even have at home to refer back to. And if I could just interject really quick, um, if you do follow, choose to follow on Twitter, Project Lit and Jared, and um, see what other libraries and schools are doing, you'll get a lot of great ideas for other ways to implement Project Lit. We are not the only example. Um, it really is just a, kind of like an outline to fit whatever your institution looks like. So libraries do it, schools do it, community organizations do it, churches do it, like so many different people do it and there's so many ways to do it and it's really about what way works, looks best for you. Exactly. It can manifest any way that you want it to. The whole purpose of it is spotlighting diversity. Yes. So however you choose to do it, just do it right and, mm. it'll, <laughs> and it'll be good. Uh, there is an entire community that supports Project Lit on Twitter and on Facebook, so you'll be able to fellowship with those people. There is a Project Lit Summit that happens annually that you can actually physically attend if you're able and meet people face to face and talk about what works, what doesn't work, and meet authors too. They actually had Kwame Alexander at their last Project Lit Summit because it has reached people nationally. It is a very, very big, amazing thing. There's so much author buy-in to this, it's insane. It's a really great thing um, to jump on board with. And also with Soki Book Fest, just because we have Yaz Book Con now, does that mean that we're going to stop representing teens at our Soki Book Fest? We're still going to have tons of writing workshops and teen panels and authors and everything for them for mm -hmm. the foreseeable future. And we will have different things for our Yaz Book Con that continue in the same vein moving forward. So we have a list of all the resources that we mentioned, including the apps to Project Lit on Twitter. Um, and we have our own Twitter page for our chapter of Project Lit if you want to follow us. I also have a link to the presentation. If you did not download it already, there is a link to the Google Slides. There's an article about how Project Lit got started. Um, my references to the articles of people of color accounting for and it says 22%. When you go into the article, <coughs> at the very bottom, it has a redaction that talks about it only being about 12%. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> like, maybe fix oh, that. Yeah. Not 22%. It's 12 And then Diverse Book Finder is an amazing resource. If you do not use that, please start. It's a very easy way for you to type in themes. You can use it really easily in story times to find books that represent diverse audiences. Yeah. And we also have the link to apply for Project Lit if you're interested. Yaz BookCon has its own website. If you want to check out our author list, check out what we're doing, there's a schedule on there. It's going to be able to paint a better picture than I've been able to verbalize probably. So go in and check that out at 2018.yaz bookcon.org, and we also have a link to We Need Diverse Books, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. And I just had a few at the end of a symposium, symposium stipend for Yalta. Um, don't be afraid to apply for it. I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by resources that are offered to us and we don't take the leap. Um, so if you are wanting to get inspired and see something cool, Yalta was just an amazing experience for us and we're still reeling from ideas from it. And they do offer every year um, an opportunity to get funded to go there. So don't be afraid to apply for that. And then also just check out their website. They're a division of ALA um, and they've got amazing resources on their website. Um, there's also a great teen book finder if you're just trying to build your teen collection at your library and you need to find um, books um, specifically for teens and YA authors, um, check that out. And also, uh, I wanted to give you all a link to the Teen Advisory Board page. We dedicated a space on our website for that so that teens can fill out a form to apply if they'd like to, or they can download a PDF application. And it just you know, reiterates a lot of what I've already covered about what it's about and um, gives a general explanation. And I wanted to also clarify something. The Yalza Symposium stipend is a way to get to Yalza. The yes. Yalza contest that we won, uh, where we used the funds to create our theater camp, to buy books for Project Lit, all that kind of thing, 
that is a separate thing. If you attend the YALSA symposium, then you are going to be able to apply for the YALSA contest and participate in it. And for us, it was just a video contest that we made with teams. And we used some teams that we just already knew to create it in like Movie Maker or something. And we submitted it and we actually won. So that's where those funds came from. All right. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for hanging in with us. And please feel free to contact us um, via email. But we would love to answer some questions right now. All right. Thank you very much to Veronica and Laura Beth. If this is your first time with a KDLA uh, webinar, if you will just hang on towards the end, we do have a few reminders about upcoming events, as well as a survey uh, for IMLS to help us fund future training opportunities. Right now, there are two questions in the chat. I'm going to take them um, in reverse order, just because the second question that was submitted goes back to the very beginning of the presentation. And um, you know, we're going to kind of start a discussion small and then broaden out. So Christina asks, for theater camp, was there any sort of cost for attending, and did you have registration? So, oh, I'm sorry, did you have a registration process with a maximum number of attendees? OK, great question. We did not charge um, any fee for them to attend. Um, the place that we, the BG On Stage local theater we partnered with, they are a nonprofit, so they did this of their own accord. Um, the only thing, the funds that we used from Yal the YALSA programming prize um, covered just props, back, the backdrop that we painted, just a few extra things that we needed to purchase. So there was no fee for the kids. Um, we did set a limit of 20 participants in the theater camp. Um, a few dropped out last minute, and so we ended up only having 18 because the waitlist people that we contacted, it didn't end up working out because it was too last minute. So we had a total of 18 kids, but we capped it at 20 because we really felt like that was a manageable group um, to spend a really long time with every day over a week. And honestly, if you look at plays, a lot of them don't have super long um, cast lists. Um, we got like our script, it was like a free script online. So we were trying to be mindful of that as well to make sure that every teen who participated felt like they had a good role in the play. Um, and then to answer the final question, we did have um, them fill out a form online, much like a Google form, to fill out basic info. And as we selected who would attend the theater camp, we gave priority to kids who had no experience with theater before. So some of the teens who applied had like attended many, many camps in the past um, or had been able to uh, participate in lots of plays. And so we wanted to make sure we were giving the service to teens who had not had access to that um, previously. I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Oh, sorry. I just realized I read a question that was not live on the call. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, our second question um, is looking at a little bit bigger picture issue. Carolina asks, sometimes teens have the best of intentions, but they end up not attending events they were to run. Do you prepare a plan B, or what do you do? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah. I well, I think our plan B always is we're there. So worst case scenario, no one shows up that they're supposed to show up to run the program. We're going to run that program that they planned one way or the other. Um, but at least with the teen advisory board, there's 11 members. So in my experience, if I tell them all to be somewhere, the odds are in my favor that at least one of them is going to show up. Yeah, we have been lucky in the fact that they have invested in mm -hmm. the things that we're doing, but we don't get perfect attendance for even meetings. Like mm -hmm. sometimes we'll have like what, like three kids yeah. attend, and we don't do anything that's going to get us in that bind. So when we did criminal activity that in, did end up being teen created and teen run, 
we still, we did a lot of prep work up front that involved the teens. So we got it to a place that if we absolutely had to, we could for sure run that event ourselves. We, our backup plan is kind of us and us pre-prepping everything so that in the event that a teen's car breaks down or, right. you know, which is very likely, or a Happy. teen forgets or a teen oversleeps or a teen gets sick, very, very likely things, we don't have our hands in our pockets and we're not confused on what to do. So Laura Beth and I were both present. And for the bigger events like that, we would normally both be present so that we could pull it off. And I just wanted to add that um, to help convey to them the importance of them showing up, it's good to just sit down with them ahead of time and be like, hey, and just share that. Like, this is really a big deal. This is really important. It's important that you be there and it's important to us that you be there. And, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to shoot them a text the day of, the day before, um, to remind them because their lives are so busy. So that communication um, throughout the planning process is super important. And something else to know uh, that will help you a lot, when you are planning something with teens, you're going to be doing this probably at least a month out. That's usually how we, how we plan our events anyway you're going to be able to tell how excited they are. Mm -hmm. So if you're planning something with them and it's like you're pulling teeth to get them to do it with you and to help you and all that kind of thing, that's a red flag that you need to pay attention to because that might mean that you're going to be the only one there that day running that program and maybe you all should either not do it or do something else. If your teens are really excited about it, they're really on board, then it's very likely that you will have them show up and participate, but you still have to anticipate, you know, Maybe someone's car is going to break down, maybe someone's going to get sick, maybe someone's going to forget, but ge generally you're going to actually have your teens show up. So just pay attention to the red flags leading up to it as well. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, well, thank you again to our wonderful host. It looks like based on the questions alone, we have enough topics for a future uh, teen programming <laughs> webinar. Um, at this time, <laughs> at this time, we're going to move to our wrap-up slides for almost the top of the hour. Just a reminder that on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you can download the slides from today's webinar. And just realize that this uh, IMLS survey link is not appearing in the box, so that will instead be emailed out with your um, certificate of attendance. To stay up to date on future youth services library trainings and more information, make sure you are subscribed to the Kayak Listserv. It's a discussion list devoted to those who work with children and teens in Kentucky libraries. To subscribe, simply send me an email with the subject line Kayak. You can find out more about all the services provided by KDLA to youth serving staff. By visiting our Youth Services page, you can find out about our book kits, our thematic program kits, our Science and Play to Go exhibit with the Kentucky Science Center, and more. Don't forget we have a separate page devoted to all things summer reading, which will be updated by the end of the year with all resources for the upcoming 2019 program. And while you're there, do not forget that coming up later this month, We'll be returning with um, our very own conference devoted to summer reading and all things youth services. So Kentucky Youth Librarians of List Off, a youth services retreat. You can find more information at the youth services retreat page on KDLA's website, including our preliminary agenda and registration. You can always follow KDLA on social media via Twitter or Facebook. And with that, thank you for attending today's webinar. I will end the recording, but if you have any more questions, I will stay on the line for a few more minutes. Thank you so much, and have a great day.